Greetings, good people, and a very warm welcome to you all. So is it still possible to find a cheap vintage watch with a good quality Swiss movement inside? Well, today I have decided to feature a brand that has more history than Rolex. I mean, it was founded in the 1800s, so technically it does have more history than Rolex. It is a rotary automatic from the 1970s with a quick set day date complication. Rotary may be known as a British company nowadays headquartered in London, but it started life as a Swiss brand founded in La Chaux de Fonds in Switzerland all the way back in 1895, which is kind of funny as Rolex started its life as a British company based in London and is now a famous Swiss brand based in Switzerland. Although Rotary in its current incarnation uses a lot of Japanese movements, the vintage watches had some really nice Swiss movements in them. You may have seen this piece in my bag of spares and repair watches that I purchased a while back in this video up here. And although it may not be as valuable as Rolex, I have decided to restore this one to show some of you tinkerers out there that you don't have to break the bank for a nice Swiss project, especially those of you new to the tinkering game. If you're lucky enough, you can pick up a vintage Swiss rotary for under £50 spares or repairs, and it will probably have a really nice movement from any of the famous Ebouche manufacturers such as ETA, Adolf Shield, Peso and the likes. This piece has a 21 joule automatic movement from Adolf Shield, dated to around 1971 with a quick set date function which is not currently working. It may seem trivial now but quick set dates were still a big thing back then and Rolex only adopted a quick set date in 1977 with the 3035 movement. Without a quick set function one would have to adjust the hands manually 24 hours to change the date once. So imagine you accidentally went a day forward, you would manually go around 30 more times to get it back to the correct date. But with this movement, you can just push the crown to change the date rapidly. The case has a thick gold capped finish and a lot of the gold is still intact. So I'll try and preserve as much of that as possible and make the case look respectable. Initially, I thought the plexiglass could also be salvaged but it has a big crack around the edge, so we'll need to replace that. And then all we need is a nice fresh strap to finish it off. So a nice easy one today to get this one looking pleasing to the eye and usable again. So let's crack on. So you can see that crack goes all the way around it. So we'll have to do something about that. The case is actually in really nice condition. If you want to just spruce up a watch like this for, for a quick sale, then all you need to do is give it a little buff, change that crystal, remedy the movement. The back also wouldn't need much for an amateur. I'm sure you'd be able to sort that out. And then a fresh strap. So let me do this one for you guys quickly and show you how you can spruce up a watch like this for resale or for yourselves without too much faff. Manually it winds, something rattling inside I suspect is the rotor. It won't start. The hands do change. So the day change is over but nothing happened to the date. Let's try it again. So the day changes. Oh the date changed over as well but it's supposed to have a quick set function and the quick set isn't working by the looks of it. We'll have a look at that. Other than that, it's a nice little piece with a very cool case design with some nice contours staining around those indices. Some of these rotaries from this era had some lovely movements inside them. So I'm hoping this is one of those. Oh, sweet. That's the thing that was rattling around in there, the rotor. But that is nice. Clean movement. Oh, the balance swing. Oh, it wants to go. It wants to play, doesn't it? But something's not letting it. You can see, hairspring looks nice. Everything looks nice and tidy. Doesn't look like it's got any service marks in the case back. So it probably hasn't been serviced for the past 50 years. So let's get the movement out. I do get really bad hay fever. So my nose is a bit stuffy. If I take any sort of medication, 
puts me to sleep. Let's remove this. I'm hoping that is something just on the surface and not the actual paint itself. If it isn't, then that will clean up quite nicely. Let's put the stem back in. So let's just remove this balance in case we have an accident and then I'll go back on the other side and remove the date disc. There isn't anything holding this day disc in such as a clip or anything so I should just be able to remove that. So we have a little date card here, it's holding everything in. Got a lot of interesting things going on here. A jumper there for the date. Oh, is there a spring? And we'll go for the day jumper next. The day jumper has got its own little spring attached to it. And then we have this unlocking yoke spring for the date indicator. So we have this little driving wheel here for the calendar. And we have this another unlocking yoke here for the date indicator. I should come off like so. Double teething hour wheel, you see. It's got two sets of teeth on there. Call a spade a spade here. Huh? And I think I'll leave the rest in as it is. I don't think that cannon pinion is attached to the center wheel on the other side. It's not friction fitted on anyway. We have this cover. We'll save that bit for later. Let's remove this automatic Another one there. Oh. That's a tidy little unit, you know. You're pretty. I think the third little screw was holding this together. Should I remove that afterwards? But no dramas bit gunky and we have the reduction wheel Ooh. and the stop click won't let go come on it's okay you'll be back together once again once I've cleaned you clingy he's got separation anxiety <laughs> yeah I think so there's the reverse mounted and there's a spring there as well. Those two springs look very similar. And the reason why our oscillating weight was loose because of this bolt here, it wasn't probably tightened up properly. We'll remove that because the spring for the stop click is just underneath that. And there is the spring. Ooh. That's the lower bridge and we'll have some nice lubrication on it and there's the upper bridge for the automatic device there is a bit of power in there there's quite a bit of power in there actually let's start off with the ratchet wheel and crown wheel those lovely wings on the ratchet wheel let's remove that little click and it is little 
when the screw is even smaller. This got the old man syndrome. I've had that piece of dust on my tweezers all this time. Don't forget the spring. Remove the barrel bridge. slide that out and now we have a train bridge now then let's come at it from this side and that was nice and easy now you can see that AS logo there, which is based on the 1902. So we'll start off with this soup seconds wheel, and driving gear to the crown wheel. We have this large driving wheel, and then we have the third wheel, and there's the escape wheel. And that's it really, just the pallet. And that's it for this side. Okay, so we have this cannon pinion guard just here. Okay, so my card was full and I've decided to change up my lens, try a new lens. I've tried all the OEM lenses for this camera. So I thought I'll try a, an aftermarket one. That looks nice actually. Setting lever spring, actually, while I was changing out the lens and the memory card, I forgot where I was. So we can remove the cannon pinion. There's the minute wheel. There's the setting wheel. The depth of field on this new lens is just very unforgiving. Look at this cool little yoke spring. Round. And back on itself. So let's remove that before it decides to take flight. And there's the yoke. And we have this setting lever return spring here, which you don't normally see. It sits behind the winding pinion. So we'll remember that. And we have this long unlocking yoke spring. They had metal to spare back in the day. And all we have left is the setting lever. And there she goes. Now on the Calibre 1902, there is a separate little piece about that big, which acts as the brake spring. Because of this straight shape here, that butts up against the wall, I imagine, and helps it to slip round. This main spring is really dirty, so I'm going to give it a clean before I stick it in my machine. Look at all that. Bloody hell. Don't know whether to put this in or not. Would it survive? Look at that beautiful blue paint on it. But would they have done this if it wasn't meant for the cleaning machine? There's only one way to find out. Let's stick it in.
So this case is pretty decent. Looks like it's got some rolled gold on it. So I'm just gonna give it a quick clean and then give it a once over with some rouge just to flatten some of those marks on. You see you've got this little sunburst pattern here. So I wanna keep all that. There's no point removing all that gold and losing all that lovely texture on this one we'll restrain ourselves a little bit with the case if we look and scrutinize it we can see how deep some of those marks are but sometimes you have to weigh up the options between removing everything and replating it or in this case where the shape of the case and everything is original i think it might be better just to tidy it up and leave all those beautiful contours alone especially with that sunburst we'll tidy it up and that will look quite nice as it is so you can see the state of this plexiglass that cracked all the way around hello what are you bloody looking at you want to start something yeah 303 maybe oh because it's cracked might be giving me some funny numbers And I have a really nice low dome one, which is a 306. I think that would look quite nice actually. It should go in. Just needs a little bit of precision. Ooh. Still out a little bit here. That will go in. Oh yeah, that looks quite nice. This one is used as well. So I'll tidy that up. And I think this low dome one will look nice. The original one was at a higher dome. This one looks quite sleek. Or oh, I've got another 306, which is slightly higher. Let's have a look what that one looks like. Let's experiment. I haven't got time to use tools. And that's what that one looks like. So we've got a choice. But this one is new. I can stick that one in. Actually, I do like the flat one, to be honest. But because of this flat surface round here, which is a break from the rest of the case, it might be better just to go for something similar to the original slightly higher if it was a, a sort of curved flowy case then maybe my choice would have been a better option but because we have this flat surface here it might be better to have a stepped one where it goes up and then round rather than a flowy one because our case isn't very flowy cool bit of design 101 there for you Just give it a rub with a cloth and see how that looks. This might take a little bit of time, but it's very therapeutic. Not looking too bad. See the difference? So I've done as much as I can with the polishing cloth and there's always the temptation to give it a quick rub with the machine but it looks all right. There's a lot of gold still on there. But I think I'll restrain myself just do the case back a few tool marks here and there i could probably get away without even using the lapping machine on this for this so it's got a mirrored finish around the outside and a satin circular grain in the center so let's take this into the polishing room and sort that out can i come you sure you want to come into the polishing room with me
Come on then, you can come along and watch. So as you can see that one, pesky little thing, still doesn't want to come out, the rest of them are out. I can do a bit more and get that one out, but I think I'll leave it as a souvenir, what do you reckon? I'll give it one more bash. Now I'm just going to give it all a little buff on the center as well. Ah, oh, what the hell, I'll give this a quick rub with the rouge. That's all I'm going to do. So I haven't really added any more compound onto my mop. I'm just using whatever that was on there. And it's a very fine mop, so it's not taking much off at any one time. And so all I'm doing is I've rubbed it with the dirty, the, the dirty side with the compound on it, which has deposited a lot of the rouge on there. So it's almost acting like a protective film. And then I'm just using the clean side just to mop it off and that should be enough I think
Now I'm quite certain that this is the original mainspring and when it's an old mainspring I do like to give it a little massage with some oil before I put it on but there are other ways of doing it we'll put some on top here and that should seep in over time and lubricate the whole mainspring I do use a clear version of this oil I bought a fluorescent one to see if I can make it look good on camera and this oil is slightly viscous so it shouldn't mix into the breaking grease or 9104 1300 that should be enough and let's get the arbor in Apologies for my big head getting in the way in a couple of shots. I'm trying out a new lens which allows me a bit more room, but I'm still getting used to this extra space which my head keeps inadvertently occupying. Head wheel. The driving wheel. And that driving wheel can go there. Look at that, in first time. The boom. That feels very smooth. And that's the crown wheel core. You can get a little bit on there as well. Let's get the click in now. And we'll go for the spring first. We'll oil the post. So that print on the ratchet wheel is still there. And I might as well get the pallet fork in there while I'm at it. And we can just give it a little wind and just test it before we screw it down. We'll do a little bit of oiling before we go any further. We can put a little bit on this one as well. I'm actually not that happy with my current camera setup and would like to upgrade if anyone can advise me on best sort of setup for still videography do let me know
that way it'll go in here. And that's for the when we do the quick set date, that should spring it back like so. Now we'll just oil up the posts and the rest of the keyless. The British weather is a bit of a psychopath. Middle of July and it's chucking it down. Put a little bit here. As this doesn't sit on a post, but sits in a hole just here. We need a spring. So you pay attention. You can see where the grease needs to go. Just here and up to here. And before I put the keyless cover on, we'll get this unlocking yoke on here. Like so. And again, I think we have a contact point here. So we'll just give it a quick rub. Tiny bit. We'll get the setting wheel on. So this minute wheel is going to be sitting here and will be butting up against this spring. So as I mentioned in the intro, you can find some really nice Swiss movements in these pre-1980s rotaries. And a lot of people won't take a second glance at some of these rotaries that are on auction sites such as eBay, unless someone takes a picture of the movement inside and includes it in the listing. And if you're a tinkerer just getting good at movement servicing after practicing on some cheap stuff, then these are a good step up on the ladder without risking too much financially. You'll also find movements that were very popular and used by multiple brands, so easier to find parts. Rotary as a brand is still live and kicking to this day, but like many Swiss brands during the quartz crisis in the 1970s and 80s, it had to adapt to exist. The modern rotaries have their own unique design, but also try and follow trends set by expensive luxury brands and produce a lot of homage style watches with Japanese movements. Rotary was founded by Moise Dreyfus in Switzerland in 1895 and in the early 1920s the company did a lot of exporting into the UK which became its most successful market to a point where it was the official supplier to the British military and this relationship with the British army during the Second World War forged a loving bond with the British people and it is said that a rotary watch found its way into almost every household in Britain and that bond with the brand still exists to this day. Rotary's head office is based in London and you'll see a lot of the modern pieces named after streets and areas in London. The brand uses Japanese quartz and automatic movements in a lot of their fashion models but they do also use Swiss movements in some models. The company is also part of the Dreyfus & Co group named after the founder and they offer watches with more high-end Swiss movements under this brand name. So if you're looking for a nice Swiss movement similar to this one, then you need to be looking for anything pre-1980s. Okay, okay, I'll shut up now and let you guys get on with your frantic search on eBay now. But I hope that was some useful information for you guys in your quest to find similar hidden gems. So this little hair spring stud screw was missing, which I didn't notice. So I've replaced that from a, another AS movement.
Now you've seen me go all Undertaker on some of the dials that I've done previously. But on these 1970s dial, the lacquer can be very delicate and you can see all that browning is underneath the lacquer. So there's not much we can do. This as well I think is beneath the lacquer. We can do a little spot on the side and see what's going on. Nothing's really happening to be honest. All that is beneath the lacquer. I so will leave all that alone because I don't think any of that will come off. So we'll just tidy it up a little bit on the indices. Stick it back in. You can only see certain angles. So we're not gonna faff around too much. It actually looks looks quite nice if you don't go up too close. I mean this is proper macro close. That second hand looks lovely. It's like an opal. And has aged in a very beautiful way. Look at all those colours. So let's get this automatic works installed. Start off with the two springs. That wheel. I've greased up that wheel a little bit. Say hello to my little friend. So there you have it friends. There are plenty of scars left on this thing and it is a very respectable type of finish one would expect to achieve if you were to do this at home with a minimal collection of hobbyist tools. If you were to buy something in this condition with a good running movement then all you would have to do is give it a good clean, a new crystal or polish up the old one if it's salvageable, a nice fresh strap and you've got yourself a nice little vintage weekend watch. There are plenty of similar watches out there from various forgotten brands with gorgeous movements inside them for 20, 30, 40 quid 
that just need a little tidy up and they can fetch between 80 to 100 pound plus once they are clean and presentable. So what are you waiting for? Go find yourself a nice little project and blame it on me if the other half asks where the children's inheritance money has gone. I'm only kidding. Don't blame it on me. Just blame it on the voices in your head. Well, I hope you've enjoyed my company today and I hope you've all found this one useful. Take care, friends, and don't forget to caress that like button. But most importantly, leave your thoughts and comments as I always look forward to reading the comments. Look after yourselves, folks, and take care of each other. Peace, love, and blessings to you all. And if the Almighty wills, I'll see you on the next one. Tarara bit.